Good afternoon and thanks for joining us for today's brand new Healthline 3. I'm your host, Courtney Butts, and Healthline 3 is where we like to focus on ways to live a healthier, happier, and pain-free life. We'll be taking your calls and answering your questions right here live in the studio today. We'll be opening those phone lines soon, but as a reminder, make sure you're in a quiet room when you call with your TV turned all the way down so we can hear your question. That number to call will be on your screen, but it's 318-219-4569. And today we are talking all about peripheral vascular disease. And joining me today to talk about this is Dr. Britton Eaves with car your cardiologist at Willis Knight and Cardiology. Uh, I am. Mm -hmm. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, thanks for having me. Absolutely, so peripheral vascular disease is not really a disease you hear about a, a lot, I would say. Uh, so give me a brief overview of what, what it is. Okay, well, peripheral vascular disease encompasses the diseases of the arterial system as well as the venous system. It's estimated that about 20 million Americans have peripheral vascular disease. In addition to that, about as many as two million people have critical limb ischemia. Mm. When I talk about critical limb ischemia, that means that the perfusion to a limb is so poor that the patient is at risk for amputation. Unfortunately, there, mm. there are still a large amount of amputations uh, being done, and the consequences of having an amputation are very severe because typically these people are older. Uh, the, if you have a below the knee amputation, the the chance of uh, being fitted with, fitted with a prosthesis and going back to ambulating is 50%, 20% above the knee. A lot of those people end up going after their amputation, going to nursing home. Mm. Um, quality of life is not good and uh, does carry significant uh, morbidity and mortality risk as well. Yeah, okay. And you mentioned in our midday newscast that it's one of the diseases that are sometimes asymptomatic for a long time. You'd be surprised. So classically, yeah, as you mentioned, uh, I think when we were talking off the air that um, the symptoms uh, classically would be somebody that, uh, let's say when they walked, their, their uh, calves got tight or mm -hmm. kind of burned or they felt fatigued and had to stop and rest until it got better. But uh, a large amount of people actually are fairly asymptomatic. Um, that can be due to a number of reasons we really don't have time to go into here, but uh, a lot of times they are symptomatic, but they attribute their problem to, oh, I'm just getting older, I'm slowing down, or I have arthritis, or mm -hmm. uh, things like that, and so they, go, um, they don't get diagnosed. Right, right, okay. And so what is the main cause or how do people, you know, what kind of culminates into this diagnosis of peripheral? Well, we can kind of separate the uh, arterial from the, from the venous. The arterial problems are essentially the same as uh, cardiovascular risk factors, which most people are familiar with. Mm -hmm. uh, the number one cause would be diabetes. Diabetes is a, is a terrible, terrible, devastating disease. And so that's the number one cause. The number two cause which that one is preventable, um, and that's smoking. And then of course other factors as, uh, such as high lipids and uh, cholesterol rather. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what was I trying to, high lipids, anyway. With um, a lot of lifestyle factors as well? Yeah, uh, just a normal lack of exercise mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, and uh, you know, not eating the proper foods and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Yeah. But, but it's basically the same risk factors that would put you at risk for developing heart disease mm -hmm. are the same risk factors that put you at risk for developing uh, peripheral, va peripheral arterial disease. Um, and so any, you, a lot of those you can modify, you can get your cholesterol under control, you can have your high blood pressure treated, you can certainly uh, get diabetes treated if you mm -hmm. have that. And then also uh, an awareness uh, to, to be evaluated for it. And if you have any of those kind of symptoms where you're not able to walk like he used to and so yeah. forth. Now, venous disease, um, multitudes of things, you know, anybody's at risk for developing a blood clot in their vein. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go on a long, say, an international flight, uh, sometimes people who are truck drivers that go on long hauls, they're at risk. If anybody's mm -hmm. on a long haul, uh, car ride, so mobility, uh, trauma, uh, we see it a lot of times after surgery, people laying in the bed for uh, recovering from surgery, develop blood clots, and used to, uh, even as uh, soon as uh, say 10 years ago for sure, we just put those patients on blood thinners, and if the clot was above the knee, 
only 50% of them had a significant resolution of their clot and they were left with sort of debilitating symptoms mm -hmm. of swelling and so forth. But now we have technologies that it can actually extract the clot. Oh wow. And there's some other anatomical stuff again, you know, we could talk for hours about this, we really don't have time today, but you can actually have compression of the vein um, mm. from crossover from the artery. We can stent those and we can treat that. Uh, people also suffer from superficial venous insufficiency where they have the varicose veins and things mm -hmm. like that and those can be stripped and treated as well. So technology is really caught up with the disease. So Cool. Yeah, okay, and so um, quick anatomy lesson if you want to share with okay, us. Okay, sure. You know, art uh, your arteries versus your veins. You know, your heart's a well-oiled machine for your body. Um, but kind of explain maybe the differences between the arteries and the veins. Okay, well the arteries are um, of course, they handle the pressure that comes from the, the heart. That's where you measure your blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So they're a high pressure circulation system. And their job, in a nutshell, obviously much more things they do. They uh, supply nutrients and things like that. But one of the primary jobs is to supply oxygen to the cells so that they can metabolize and do whatever function that they're mm -hmm. uh, designed to do. So yeah. when you have an obstruction there, of course, there's decreased perfusion, and if it's bad enough, you can actually have tissue breakdown to where you have wounds on the feet and mm -hmm. so forth that won't heal. Mm -hmm. And this many times is what leads to uh, someone in a crisis where they're faced with, if they don't restore circulation, they end up with an amputation. Gotcha, okay. And then the, conversely, the veins, they have another job, right? So the veins uh, job is to return blood to the heart. And they're thin-walled, they are anatomically quite different mm -hmm. than arteries. And as I said before, sometimes people, the, the big artery that comes from the heart, the aorta, is on the left side, and the big vein that returns blood to the heart is on the right side. Mm -hmm. But down about the level of the belly button, they have to cross over to bring blood and return blood from each lower extremity. And when it gotcha. does that, the artery can actually compress the vein and so uh, that can cause intermittent swelling or even blood clots and that can be treated with stenting. Also, um, there is uh, much larger than people would uh, probably suspect. There are uh, sub-segments of the population that actually have uh, clotting disorders mm -hmm, and they mm -hmm. can be asymptomatic for years mm -hmm. and that can cause uh, people to have blood clots. Right, yeah, so all the time people think, okay, I gotta keep my heart in shape, but also it's equally important to focus on the plumbing as well. Oh, <laughs> you know, for make sure, sure, for sure. It's all good. Okay, so our phone lines are open and you've got that number right there on your screen, 318-219-4569. Give us a call. We've got Dr. Britton Eves here with willis Knight in Cardiology and we're talking about peripheral vascular disease and the symptoms that are associated with that, who's at risk and all that good stuff. So we'd love to hear from you. So, uh, so who typically is that person or that candidate that's at risk for this disease? Well, all of us are at risk because, as I said before, you know, without uh, you know the usual things that we should be doing to take care of ourselves, we all potentially are, are at risk for developing diabetes at some point in our life. Um, certainly, uh, smoking can lead to that uncontrolled hypertension. And unfortunately, uh, a big problem as well is uh, uh, folks that end up with uh, renal insufficiency or kidney failure bad enough that they have to go on long-term dialysis. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, those people uh, develop something we call hyper, a secondary hyperparathyroidism, and so they have a disorder in managing their calcium, and so they tend mm -hmm. to really develop a lot of calcifications in the artery. We do have a lot of new technologies to treat those, but that's, uh, I really feel like that's something that uh, in the future, medicine continually advances. And I think on those patients, if we can find the key to, to better help them manage their calcium, that might be a way to, to prevent or, or lessen the impact of some of the disease on them. But anybody potentially is at risk. And mm -hmm. it's important to know too that, you know, you say, well, if, if most of the people, majority of people actually quote asymptomatic, why? Are we rushing out to treat treat these things? Right, yeah. Well, it carries a, a significant uh, morbidity and mortality rate. Uh, even people with uh, what uh, classically been described as sort of mild to moderate 
uh, once they get into that moderate range and, and there's a simple test that uh, the doctor can do and it's a screening test. We simply mm -hmm. measure the pressure in the arm and we measure the pressure in the ankle mm -hmm. and we divide the ankle pressure by the arm pressure. Mm -hmm. So if we don't have any obstruction from here to here, it should be one. It okay. should be the same. And so as that number decreases, mm. that implies the severity of the, of the obstruction. Right. So when we get down to a level of 0.8, which in the past was described as m mild to moderate claudication, those patients actually have the prognosis of a woman who has a new diagnosis of breast cancer. Oh, wow. Which is really crazy. And once it gets down yeah. to a level of about 0.4, which is severe, and most of those people have, uh, they kind of claudicate all the time. You know, I have some really sad stories. I've had people that actually had to uh, uh, sleep with their leg hanging off the side of the bed because they needed that extra pull of gravity to get enough blood in there. That's the only mm. way they could get some relief. But those patients, once you get down to that level, their uh, five-year survival uh, approaches are it's actually about the same as colon cancer, believe mm. it or not, mm -hmm. and is approaching the prognosis for lung cancer. Okay. So in cl you said claudicate. Can you explain what so that means? I'm sorry. Claudication just yeah. simply, you know, if you really want to do a deep dive, it comes from, <laughs> I think, the uh, uh, Claudius, one of the uh, uh, Roman emperors, okay. and they said he had a limp, and we're not sure if he had peripheral vascular disease. But anyway, mm -hmm. so that's, that's where the term came from. But, but what it means is uh, pain or fatigue or mm -hmm. sort of loss of mu muscle function gotcha. with exertion. If you think about the muscles, when the activity increases, they need more oxygen. Mm -hmm. So it's really a oxygen demand supply mismatch. Gotcha. Very interesting. And so that kind of causes those symptoms that you would associate with peripheral vascular disease of the pain in the legs, the aches maybe in the calves that you mm -hmm. mentioned. Uh, so when should someone worry? Let's say maybe they have arthritis and they're not sure, do I have peripheral vascular disease or is it just my arthritis, like we mentioned earlier? What are ways to do that? Maybe just see a cardiologist? Well, I mean, it's a multidisciplinary um, mm. approach, really, yeah. is how it should be. Um, and so your primary care doctor is a good place to start. First off, your primary care doctor is going to be the one that's helping modify your modifiable risk factors, and that's control mm -hmm. of your hypertension, control of your diabetes, weight loss, smoking cessation, all those things. And a basic way is just to check and see if they can feel the pulses on your feet. And if they don't have time for that, they certainly can send, send them to us. We can do a ultrasound or, or do the tests that I talked about before the acule, acle brachial index, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. is, uh, I mean, that's just a matter of taking a blood pressure here and a blood pressure there, and it's, it's pretty accurate. Sometimes it can be falsely elevated with calcium, but, but again, that's kind of an aside. But mm -hmm. Okay. And so is swelling also associated with this? Swelling is usually associated with venous insufficiency okay. because, again, uh, with arterial, there's a uh, deficit of bringing blood into an extremity, so mm -hmm. it's difficult for it to swell. Okay. Uh, a classic presentation of somebody that has pretty significant peripheral vascular disease would be, peripheral arterial disease, excuse me, would be loss of pulses, mm -hmm. where you can't feel mm -hmm. the pulses on the foot. Uh, extremity would tend to be cool, sometimes severe in men, you might actually have loss of hair on the extremity because there's not enough perfusion mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm and then uh, wounds and so forth. And one of the saddest things I, I see a lot of times, I, I know even as a physician, I'm sometimes very hard-headed about, <laughs> you know, oh, it'll be fine, I'll get over it. And it, it's, you know, we tend to be a little stoic and just press on with our lives. But many times I see people come in and they've got this horrific wound on their mm -hmm. toe or something like that. And how long has this been here? Weeks and it's in a mess. And, and the thing that I would like to really strike home on that, people don't realize that that might be the marker. If you have a, even a small wound, say on a, your toe, mm -hmm. big, great toe, small toe, wherever, that may be a marker for underlying severe peripheral vascular disease. If it's not healing, people don't appreciate that if it's not healing and it's not taken care of, it actually could result in loss of a limb. Mm -hmm. And so it's better to uh, I would encourage anybody that uh, is maybe seeing home health wound care for a non-healing wound 
to be referred for a evaluation of their arterial blood supply mm -hmm. because we restore blood flow to that that wound will heal and that limb will be saved I mean that's sort of my main focus yeah. is to mm. try to keep people from losing their limbs yeah. I mean, because mm -hmm. um, it goes way beyond the medical aspects, you c as you could well imagine. It's very devastating right. to lose an extremity. And on top of that, you lose mobility mm -hmm. and your quality of life right. suffers because of that. And then, of course, the we're designed to be upright, mobile creatures. And the more you sit, the more you have to lay in the bed. You just put at risk for all other things. And then the other thing, again, I'll just reiterate, is if you have peripheral vascular disease, you have a fair chance that you also have significant coronary disease mm. or carotid disease, which is, you know, can lead to strokes and things like that. Right, okay. And typically, so this might be a funny question, but can you also have peripheral vascular disease at the same time that you have peripheral arterial disease? Oh, for sure. You can have yeah. venous and arterial, okay. yeah, for sure. Okay, because similar risk factors, I'm sure, and mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Um, very interesting. So let's talk about some treatment options. Okay. Uh, so we've talked about maybe all the scary things to look for, but how, you know, is this something that we can maybe, like somebody's having severe pain in their legs, uh, can that pain be reversed or taken care of through treatment? Absolutely. And that's, that's uh, you know, I worked hard to get here, school and everything, and, and I'm, I'm blessed that I make a good living. but absolutely the most gratifying thing I do is to have a patient come in that they have to stop when they walk to their mailbox because mm -hmm. their leg hurts and when you restore blood flow you just know I tell them all the time you're gonna have a good weekend yeah you know I mean you've really impacted so I'm very gratifying to be able to be a part of that yeah um, but yeah we have all kind of great the, the field and the treatment of peripheral vascular disease is just really over the last 10 years just really exploded. So I have all kind of crazy fun toys. I have lasers <laughs> and, and uh, devices that spin at 150,000 or 180,000 RPMs. We have uh, suction devices, um, uh, drug-coated stents, drug-coated balloons, mm -hmm. all kind of things. As a matter of fact, uh, on Wednesdays, which was yesterday, was my leg day and uh, uh, had a guy that had a, a completely occluded uh, blood vessel behind his knee that he'd been trying to get fixed for a while. We fixed that yesterday, it's very gratifying. Mm -hmm. Had a fairly young woman that had a, uh, her entire iliac, which is the division off the aorta that feeds her, it fed the entire lower extremity, was 100% blocked from here mm -hmm. to here, got that opened up. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of things that we can do. Yeah. So, you know, like I tell patients, we're certainly not God. Mm -hmm but we are able to save the vast majority. In fact, I sort of make it a, feel like a sort of a failure, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hanging on to that extremity to the, to the bitter end. And, and also we have some great stories too where people have actually been uh, scheduled for an amputation and oh came wow. and saw me and we saved their leg and that's, uh, I saw this one patient uh, not too long ago, the, the day that I did the first procedure on her, she canceled her appointment to go and have her mm -hmm. leg amputated, and that was about seven years ago. Oh wow, oh my gosh, and still has the leg. Mm -hmm. and still still ambulating. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So, so for example, t your t most maybe common things are getting, that, getting rid of that clot, or you know, get it using a balloon to maybe open it, or we extracting it. We have balloons it. and stents, and uh, and uh, suction devices that remove mm -hmm. the clot and so forth. The other thing that's really come a long way that was a huge uh, cause of mortality for post-op patients particularly was pulmonary embolism and that's where you have a large clot that uh, usually begins in the leg from trauma or immobility or things like that and then it just suddenly is able to migrate and it goes up into the lungs and it can completely obstruct the blood flow into the lungs and uh, unfortunately, uh, was a not wasn't common, but it wasn't uncommon mm -hmm. to have the rare patient. You know, you're about to send them home from surgery, and and they had a blood yeah. clot. And so anyway, so now uh, we have uh, several devices and techniques that we do to treat uh, uh, 
pulmonary embolism, and we do a lot of them at Willis Knight, and there's, uh, uh, they do them at all three of the camps. They do them at Piermont, Bossier, mm -hmm. and, and North, and, and that's been very gratifying awesome. as well because, again, just like when I mentioned the blood clot, in the past, before we had these devices, we just put the patient on blood thinner and hope for the best, mm -hmm. but now we have actual treatments to To, to actually treat it. see that difference. Oh, it's very gratifying yeah. to see somebody mm -hmm. in, in dire straits, distress, and do right. the procedure and then come see them the next day and they're ready to go home. That's very okay. gratifying. Yeah, okay, and so when you're maybe just specifically talking about the legs, are these minimally invasive procedures? Well, minimally invasive in that uh, it's all done, we call it endovascular, which okay. means we go through the vascular system. Mm. Okay. Now we're sneaky yeah. like that, you know. The okay. When I first started off, we had sort of a, we, we have a very uh, great relationship now with our vascular surgery community and, 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 and I said multidisciplinary. When I first started off, it was kind of a little turf war. They didn't really know, you know, had these cardiologists that were dabbling in, you know, this is not a heart, what are you guys doing? But now everybody does end up, because, you know, it's, uh, as you said, it's less invasive. There's mm -hmm. less uh, potential morbidity, mortality, and there's so much that can be can be done. You know, we can put stents in uh, for aortic aneurysms, which before was a major surgery. Mm -hmm. We can do that through the legs. And I have colleagues over at uh, uh, over at uh, the North Campus that actually replace valves through the arterial system, and they oh, they, wow. they do what's called structural heart. They close up uh, uh, areas of uh, it's called a foramen ovale that uh, separates the two atrium that can be a mm -hmm. causal stroke. They're able to do that through. Uh, the arterial system. Okay. So, I mean, technology is really. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. So, let's say after a, a procedure, um, what is maybe the risk of something like that clot coming back? Well, it's hard to say, you know, mm -hmm. it's hard to say in general because every patient is a little bit different. You know, some of the, uh, so for the arterial side, clot usually is caused by an obstruction and so there's decreased blood flow and so it clots. So when you fix the obstruction usually that's that's taken care of now mm -hmm. as far as the uh, the venous side uh, sometimes the veins are damaged and uh, some some patients may have coagulopathy or a disorder that needs to be treated but mm -hmm. so it varies from patient to patient but yeah. uh, typically what you know once we've made the diagnosis then we and we treat the problem then of course we surveil them and and do other you know try to modify yeah. risk factors and medication to prevent them from having further episodes. So. Gotcha. Okay. Very interesting. Well, we have just a couple minutes left, and if you're just joining us and you have a question for Dr. Eves here, who's a cardiologist with willis Knighton Cardiology, give us a call at 318-219-4569. Okay. So, uh, you know, we talked about the treatment. We've talked about risk factors. Uh, so let's say someone maybe has been diagnosed and they're not maybe to the point of surgery yet. Are there things that they can do, maybe exercises or other things that are, you know, less invasive or less surgical or that well, they can do? Well, back when I first started medical school, because that's all we had, they, and they would recommend, because surgery was the only thing that could be done. Mm. And it, at that time, it was a pretty major surgery. It was a bypass surgery, usually mm. requiring opening up the abdominal cavity. And so they would talk about, um, you know, exercising that caused uh, decreased blood flow. To, you know, good Lord didn't make junk. You know, the life is amazing. Organisms, human beings are amazing. So if you, if you exercise, you actually will stimulate the formation of collaterals. But that's sort of a uh, inadequate you know, I wouldn't uh, put that as a viable strategy versus getting diagnosed and getting right. treated. Yeah, okay. Because um, we really can uh, make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so if someone knows that they've been diagnosed and maybe their symptoms aren't getting any better, um, how, how hard is that process or how easy is the process to maybe get in and have that procedure done? Well, we try to make it absolutely as, as easy as, as possible, so it would just be a matter of, uh, um, you know, contacting the office or getting the primary care to, yeah. to contact us. You know, I, I actually, you know, I mentioned before multidisciplinary. Mm -hmm. uh, I get a lot of referrals from uh, wound centers, you know, mm -hmm. patients going mm -hmm. in, they have a wound that, that's not healing, and so the wound doctor will send them to me, and we'll get the ultrasound, and so that's a win-win for 
the wound care guy, win-win for me, and certainly win-win for the patient. So once the blood flow is restored, then the wound guy can go ahead, or wound gal, whoever, mm -hmm. uh, can continue the therapy and, and the wound heals, patient's happy, and so. Yeah, so after the procedure, how, how um, soon are people back to doing their activities? I send like? most of my people home the same day. Okay, nice. So this we is have uh, closure devices, so it's through, through the um, vascular system, mm -hmm. and then uh, afterwards, uh, majority of the time, I use a closure device that actually will close it right up, and then we watch them for a couple hours and send them home. And are you doing this, uh, you said vascularly, so do you have like something where you can see, you know, like a, uh, everything's so advanced now, you know, everybody's using robots, do you have like a robot that you use? No, or like um, a not so screen? far, it's a little, um, there's so much, uh, uh, eventually I'm quite sure, you know, yeah, a robot right. will take my job. But it's kind of interesting, uh, so we work, uh, I think the best way to describe it is uh, a gamer would do okay. pretty well because what you're looking at, you're looking at a uh, live fluoroscopy screen and you have, uh, you're down at the groin or the arm and you have a, a very small wire, it's 0.04, mm. it's uh, about the size of, I don't know, about four or five human hairs if they were bound together, it's a pretty small okay. wire. And so, and, and then you have the catheter, the wire, you get the wire past the blockage and the wire is like the monorail at Disney World, mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. the train goes on there. So once the monorail is there, whatever you put goes where the wire goes. Okay. And so you sit there and you watch the monitor and you can push, you can pull, you can rotate clockwise, counterclockwise, and that's pretty much it. So you have to, okay. it's a little dance that you do, you know. And start to finish, uh, I'm sure every procedure is different. Every one yeah. is different. I mean, it might be, it might be a 30-minute procedure, but we've all had procedures that uh, have been hours, you know, even four, five, six hours, and so forth. Yeah. I know. I know my crews sometimes get frustrated, but I hate to be defeated. Mm -hmm. You know, and and it is important to try to um, get the best outcome for the patient. So it just varies. For sure, yeah. So if someone's at home and they have an upcoming procedure like this, what, is there anything they can do to prepare or get ready for it? Uh, not, not anything in, in particular, per se. We usually okay. try to give them good instructions ahead yeah. of time and so forth. Yeah, so but nothing to be nervous about and... No, anticipation is the worst mm -hmm. part of anything, for sure. Is so. it, are you under anesthesia usually so for this? The great thing about it too, because it's endovascular rather than surgical, mm -hmm. we don't quote put people to sleep. Okay. Now that does not mean that they don't fall asleep. We call it monitored anesthesia. Okay. And I, I make every attempt to make the patient as comfortable as pos possible. Yeah. So we give them continual uh, pain meds and uh, some anxiolytic, like a bur you know calm their nerves. So most of the time my goal is to have people fall asleep during the procedure. Okay. My main goal would, when we're done, have the patient say, I didn't even know y'all got started. Exactly, so, yeah. So that's the goal. Awesome. But it doesn't require being put to sleep, which, you know, yeah. people are sometimes very Reserved. uncomfortable yeah. and, and afraid of that. So we don't, quote, put people to sleep. When we talk about from a medical standpoint, when we talk about putting people to sleep, we usually mean that we put them on the breathing machine like you have done when you have major surgery. Right, okay. So where can we find you if someone at home is interested in getting established with your care? Where can they find you? Well, I'm with uh, uh, Willis Knight in Cardiology. Uh, I, my primary campus is uh, at Willis Knight in Bossier. I do have partners that uh, do this types of procedures over at Willis Knight in North. And uh, another group, Piermont Cardiology, over at uh, Piermont. Some of those guys do it over there as well. Okay. But also, too, um, if you're seeing a podiatrist with a wound, uh, 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 again, I get a lot of patients from them. They're, they're seeing them for something else, and they just have notes. I don't really feel a good pulse. Right. And they'll, because we've worked together for years. I, I, I got started doing this uh, back in 2000. I don't know, one, I've been doing it for, yeah, for a while. good long time, 15, awesome. 20 years, something like that. And so it's really grown over time. Yeah, exactly. Um, but well, just being aware, uh, a cool extremities, 
lack yes, of pulse, exactly. fatigue, tiredness when you walk. And for sure, if you have yes. a wound Thank on your foot. Thank you for joining sorry. us. <laughs>